Chapter 13 Awareness slowly struggled to overcome the blackness swirling inside Fullman's mind. His head felt as if a goblin was pounding inside on a drum. And why did it sound like someone kept calling his name? He found he was unable to move his arms and legs. Something was restraining him, something that felt uncomfortably like ropes being drawn tight around his body. He tried opening his eyes, but found them heavy. It was an effort to force them to obey. Matthias? Fullman finally forced his eyes open. The first thing he saw was Silja's face. It was filthy with dirt and grime, her hair caked in dried blood, eyes bloodshot from emotion or fatigue. She had never looked more beautiful to him. He groaned with relief as he saw her, feeling a great darkness lift from his soul. He forced a reassuring smile onto his face, trying to hide the concern that had been tormenting him. Well, at least you're in one piece, he said, looking Silja up and down. Her clothing was torn, her body was bruised and battered. Heavy ropes bound her legs together, more ropes lashed her arms to her sides and still more fastened her to a straight-backed chair in which she sat. Fulman tried moving again, and concluded that he was similarly restrained. I told you I'd look out for her. Fulman shifted his gaze, finding Lajos tied in a chair beside Silja. The strigon sported a black eye, but otherwise looked none the worse for wear. You're doing a great job, Lajos, Fulman said. I'll be sure to have you do it again. The attempt at humor brought a faint smile to Silja's face. Are you all right? she asked. When they brought you in, we thought you were dead. Fulman considered the question. His lungs felt odd, as if they were coated in fuzz, and there was a coppery taste in his mouth. He'd taken more than a few breaths of the plague doctor's concoction. They all had. He tried not to think about the many examples of Vice's diabolical craft that he had seen during their hunt tried not to consider the changes the madman's gas might be causing inside him. I'm fine, he said. Best sleep I've had in years. I really should thank Vice, right before I light his pyre. Fulman glanced around him. Now that most of the drowsiness had drained out of him, he took a more interested look in their surroundings. The room that they were in was quite familiar. They were inside Wormwater's town hall. He found that Krieger, Hausner, and the other flagellants were tied to chairs in a row behind them. To either side he found the still slumbering figures of Gernheim and Erhardt. Their captors had used chains instead of ropes on the black guardsman. It seemed they were taking no chances with the knight. Fulman turned to face Silja again. Vice got you too? he asked. Silja nodded her head. After you left, I spotted Vice in the crowd we chased him, but he got away. When we got back to the inn, someone locked us in the room. Lajos made short work of the lock. The comment caused the strigony to stare sheepishly at his feet. And we noticed something strange going on at the chapel. Matthias, it wasn't just vice. There were things there, monsters. Skaven? Thulman's voice was sharp, a sick feeling growing inside him. Under folk. Before Silja could answer, the door to the room opened. Thulman twisted his head around to see who had entered. He saw a grinning Reinheckel, robes of state swirling around him. Several militiamen and curate Andine, now wearing the white robes of a Sigmarite priest, milled about around the burgomaster. The strange headpiece he wore, looking like a fur hat with ram horns fastened to the sides, was anything but a talisman of ordained Sigmar worship. That would be telling now, wouldn't it? Reinheckel said. The burgomaster walked around the rows of chairs, resting his hand on Fulman's chair. Tell me, witch smeller, how do you find the hospitality of Wormwater now? Is everything satisfactory, my lord? Reinheckel laughed at his own joke, provoking awkward chuckles out of his men. We even held onto your woman and this strigony weasel for you. Wasn't that considerate? Reinheckel began to pace once more, coming up behind Silja's chair. She shuddered as the burgomaster leaned over her shoulder, still facing Fulman. 
Though I must admit I'm rather tempted to keep her to myself. He patted her cheek, laughing as Silja jerked away from the touch. Reinheckle stepped back and sighed. You realize, of course, that assaulting a Templar is a crime against the Temple of Sigmar, Fulman said. That makes it a heresy, punishable by several kinds of death, all of them quite unpleasant. Reinheckle laughed again, and this time the amusement of his soldiers wasn't forced. Even the old priest with the sinister headdress laughed. I think you will find, Herr Fulman, that we are most religious here in Wormwater. Reinhackel walked slowly back towards the door. Most religious indeed. In fact, we were about to renew our sacrament to our Lord. You might find it interesting. He snapped his fingers, causing the militiamen to fix their attention on him. Take them to the temple. Cold, lifeless eyes stared at Streng, frozen in an expression of surprise and accusation. The knife wound running across the corpse's belly had bled the life from the man some time ago, but all the same he had been a long time in dying. Streng had no regrets. He didn't care a jot for what the dead bastard had thought about him during his lingering death. He was out past the rocks and well within sight of his friends and their arrows. The attack had come quickly after the onset of night. The ambushers had been quiet for several hours, only firing if it looked like Streng might try to break from cover. Then, without warning or reason, the bowmen had sent a sustained volley clattering against the rocks. Streng knew that they were trying to keep his head down for some reason. He also knew that if they had a friend creeping up to flush him out, he would hardly do so with arrows whistling about his ears. The ex-soldier took note of the direction of the bow fire and braced himself for the coming assault. For all their murderous intentions, the men who ambushed him were amateurs. Streng was ready for the backstabbing assassin, springing upon him before he even rounded the boulder. A bit of gory knife work, and Streng dropped back into cover before the lurking archers could recover from their surprise. Streng listened while the man he had killed cried out in agony, begging the archers to carry word back to his wife and children. Too bad, you murderous shit, Streng thought. If things had played out your way, it'd be my blood soaking into the ground. The archers maintained their vigil throughout the night. With just two of them, though, Streng guessed they wouldn't try sneaking up on him again. Still, he wished he'd been able to strip the hunting bow from the dead one's body just to make certain. Exactly what they would try, Streng wasn't sure, and as the hours stretched, his anxiety began to increase. It seemed almost as if they were playing for time. A few hours after dawn, Streng had the answer. A group of scruffy-looking men appeared on the road, heading towards Streng's dead horse. The remaining ambushers hailed the trio, waving them over their position in the meadow. Streng swore loudly. Even if they were amateurs, now there were enough of them to do the job properly. Streng rubbed at his eyes, trying to fight the sleep tugging at him. The bastards in the meadow had probably slept in turns during the night. The mercenary spat into the dirt and turned his attention back to the dead man. The body was close, so damnably close. He could see the tightly strung hunting bow looped over the body's shoulder, the quiver of arrows hanging from his back. With that weapon in his hands, he might just be able to make his enemies pay a heavy price, if they wanted to storm his refuge. The thug looked back across the meadow at his attackers. For the moment, they were busy explaining the situation to the newcomers. He looked back at the corpse, judging the distance. Why the hell not? He grunted, launching himself from the refuge and towards the corpse. He heard the ambushers cry out in alarm as he broke cover. Another instant and their arrows would be flying. Strang's flesh crawled in anticipation of an arrow striking home. The mercenary dived before reaching the dead man, rolling him onto the side, using the corpse as a gruesome shield. He felt the body shudder as an arrow struck it. He held it fast, wrapping his arms around its waist and began to crawl backwards towards the refuge, taking it slowly to keep the body between himself and the archers. Streng heard the attackers cry out again. He gritted his teeth and swore. If they decided to charge him now, there wasn't a thing he could do about it. 
After about half a minute of desperate agonizing effort, Strang dragged himself and his shield back behind the boulders. The mercenary breathed a sigh of relief, hurriedly pulling the quiver from the corpse. And then he froze. Why were the bastards still shouting? No, they were not shouting. They were screaming, screaming like the damned. Strang risked peering from behind the boulder. Someone, no, something, was attacking the assassins. Something Strang hoped he would never see again. It might have borne more resemblance to Gregor Klausner if there had been any suggestion of life in the ghostly pallor of that flesh. If the feral expression spread across its face had borne the faintest suggestion of humanity. If it hadn't torn the arm of one of the attackers clean from the socket and wasn't now using it to cudgel the others. The fingers of its lean, almost skeletal hands ended in claws, black talons that were quickly painted crimson as they tore the throat out of one of the hunters. Vampire. It was a word that struck terror on an almost primal level, offending the very core of the human psyche. Yet it was the merest echo of the true horror evoked by the appearance of one of their fell kind. Strang felt it fully as he watched Gregor butcher his way through Kips and his friends. He broke his cover, running for the woods, injury and fatigue replaced by stark terror. He had faced vampires before, but never alone. Strang prided himself on being a man who placed his trust in no one, be they god or man. Now for the first time, he appreciated just how much confidence and faith he invested in Fulman, how much fortitude he drew from that man. Somehow, Fulman seemed the equal to whatever nightmare the ruinous powers spat from the abyss. There was something about the witch hunter that seemed to assure the triumph of light over darkness. Strang knew he had no such quality. Alone, before such unholy evil, all he could do was run. Run and maybe pray, if he could remember any of the words. Gregor stared in disgust at the carnage strewn across the meadow the debris of five human beings. He looked down at his hands, the fingers played like talons, the skin caked in wet, dripping blood. A hideous urge swelled up inside him. He bent his head towards his hands, mouth open, his tongue licking expectantly at his lips. With a shudder, Gregor recovered himself, hastily wiping the bloody hands on his clothes, furiously trying to get the residue of the massacre from his flesh. The hunger pounded inside his veins, urging him to fall on the wet, ragged corpses scattered about his feet. He sobbed in despair. How could the gods allow such an abomination to walk the land? How could they suffer such a thing to live? The sound of slow, condescending applause caused the vampire to turn his head. He could see the amused, mocking look on Carandini's face as the necromancer walked towards him. The sorcerer paused to cast an appraising glance at Gregor's victims. Nicely done, and in daylight no less. I must say I'm impressed. You really are full of surprises, Herr Klausner. I care nothing for your praise, Gregor snarled. I only want to die. The necromancer wiped a stray lock of greasy hair from his face. So you have said... It is a rather tired refrain. Well, if you've had a good rest, I suggest you get back to work. Gregor crossed his arms, glaring at the necromancer. No. Carandini regarded the vampire with a look of exaggerated disbelief. I don't believe I heard that correctly. I said no, Gregor repeated. I won't be a part of this any more. I won't take any more lives. Carandini smiled and shrugged his shoulders. All right, have it your way, he said. He turned his face upwards, shielding his eyes with his hand. Tell me, how are you enjoying the sun this bright morning? Does it burn? Does it make your skin itch? It will do far worse to you as time goes on, as your humanity withers away and the taint of the vampire consumes all that is left. Eventually the sun will wither your flesh like salt on a slug. You will be a thing of the night, body and soul. Gregor looked down, feeling a great weight pressing down upon him. Carandini always knew just what to say, what to crush his spirit and cow his defiance. I only want to die. 
As you are, Karandini scoffed. As an unholy bloodworm, feeding on the living to maintain the semblance of life in your unclean shell, you already know how fleeting such a death may be. The necromancer shifted his gaze to the distant tree line. Something flew out from the darkness of the woods, something black and winged, cawing and croaking as it flew. The reek of rot and decay impacted against Gregor's senses as the thing circled the necromancer. The horrible thing landed on Carandini's shoulder. It had been a crow, once. Its black feathers were crusty with decay, and its eyes in the skull were tiny, blind dots oozing pus. Carandini called the horrible carrion his eyes. He'd grated several of these hideous things once they'd left the banks of the River Reich, employing a spell he borrowed from the grimoire of a necromancer called Simeus Gant, the infamous crow master of Mordheim. Now the abominable corpse thing pressed its beak to Carandini's ear, as if trading words with a master. Our friend tells me there is still no sign of the witch hunter, Carandini reported with a sigh. It seems we must content ourselves with his lackey. They had come upon the standoff between Streng and the ambushers during the night, driven to the place by the vision Carandini had evoked from Nebcamento's spirit. Carandini had decided to wait, to see if Streng's master would arrive to rescue his henchman. Only when it looked like the things would favor the men from Wormwater had he at last given Gregor the order to intervene. Gregor looked at the dark, brooding tree line into which Streng had retreated. To his unclean vision, the darkness seemed warm and inviting. He struggled to resist its lure, just as he had fought back the unholy first and every other filthy abnormality the poison in his body sent screaming in his mind. The sooner you go and fetch him, the sooner we can start seeing about curing you, Carandini said, prodding the vampire with his oily words. Gregor faced the necromancer, nodding his head slowly, and then turned and stalked away into the forest inviting shadows. With each step, he could feel a little more of him rotting away, oozing from him like the corrupt fluid from the carrion crow. Gregor wondered just how much of himself was left to save. They were laid out in a row, thrown into the first line of pews facing the sanctuary of the chapel. Bound, hand and foot, the witch hunters and their associates had been carried into the temple like sacks of grain. After depositing their burdens, their captors had withdrawn, busying themselves with the ghastly transformation that was occurring all around the chapel. A large group of Wormwater citizens were hurrying around the chapel, strange burdens in their hands. As Fulman was watching, they began setting their burdens against the walls, fixing them in place on small hooks. Fulman felt sick as he saw the things, stretched skins upon which the scratch dash script of the icons of the Underfolk had been daubed in crimson ink. The fact that some of the hides still bore hair or displayed facial features left the witch hunter no illusions, what had served the degenerates as parchment. Fulman felt his revulsion increase, as Andine came out from the rear of the chapel, a ghastly idol held reverently to his breast. The witch hunter didn't like to consider from what the vile thing had been cobbled together. It was revolting enough for him to realize what it was meant to represent. The devotion with which the curate bore his burden became all the more abominable. Fulman had uncovered many a cult of perverted, diseased madmen in his career. But he had never expected to see this, never dreamed that men could allow their minds and souls to decay so far. How could any human being bow his knee before the infernal horror of the vermin god? How could any man make obeisance to the corrupt father of the Skaven? What sane mind gave their soul to the knowing hunger of the horned rat? Isolated madmen, driven by their own greed and lust for power, Tempted to betray their own race by the promise of the scheming underfolk. This was something Fulman could accept, something he had seen before. But here was an entire community, a society giving itself to the cult of the horned rat. As Fulman was watching, Andin set the ghastly effigy of the demon god on the altar, prostrating himself before it. Such was their contempt for Sigmar, the cultists hadn't even bothered to remove any of the talismans of his worship content to let the holy hammer rest in its customary place 
even as the fanged Eidolon grinned across the sanctuary. The congregation of the heretics finished dressing the temple to suit their profane sacrament, paying no heed to the enraged shouts of Hausner and his flagellants. They were certain of the power and providence of their scurrying god, having long ago abandoned any fear of Lord Sigmar, much less his devoted servants. As the townsfolk strode back towards the pews, they retrieved hideous furred garments, loathsome ratskin cloaks. When they put them on, Fulman felt his revulsion rise anew. They looked like shabby, horrible imitations of the Skaven, men transforming themselves into parodies of rats, even as the Skaven race itself was a twisted shadow of humanity. Each garment sported strange cuts, cuts that exposed the sickly, diseased malformations that infested nearly every one of the townsfolk the corrupt taint of mutation. The mutants flaunted their abnormalities, reveling in the horror of their flesh. Many put the mutations of the little girl Hausner had tried to burn down to shame in their repugnance. Bruno Reinheckel forced his way through the congregation, one of the rat-hide cloaks draped around his shoulders. The burgomaster sneered down at his prisoners. You should feel privileged, Reinheckel said. We've given you the place of honor, right up front near the altar. Normally my family and I sit here. Heretic filth, Hausner spat. You dare defile the shrine of Lord Sigmar with this abomination? Sigmar will rot your flesh for this blasphemy. Reinheckel smiled at the fanatic's outburst, turning to display his back to his prisoners. A long cut in the rat-eyed cloak displayed the lumpy, bubo-ridden skin that clothed Reinheckel's body. The Horned One already has, the Burgomeister declared. But in Wormwater we do not revile the touch of the gods. We do not cringe at the gifts they see fit to bestow upon the flesh. We accept them. We honor them. You honor madness, Krieger hissed. By Sigmar's hammer, I've uncovered the most diseased, depraved madman in my day, seen the most unholy of cults, but you've managed to distinguish yourself. Your town outshines even the lowest of them. The burgomaster shook his head, laughing. Then he straightened, striking Krieger across the mouth. Oh, I think I've borne enough of your insults, Aldorfer. I know that my community has... Krieger glared at the smirking Reinheckel, hate smoldering in his eyes. Somehow, some way, he would pay the peasant back for his temerity. Fulman's gaze was drawn back to the altar. The curate had returned, bearing with him a large bronze bell. Horrible design and symbols were engraved onto the surface, and from its midsection, the sculpted visage of a rat with antler-like horns stared at him. How, Reinheckel? Fulman asked. How does an entire community become so debased as to worship this obscenity? The burgomaster moved away from Krieger, looking down at Fulman. Wormwater has a long and distinguished history, he began. You read some of it yourself in those books I allowed you to see, but you didn't find all of Wormwater's history there. No, not all our history. You didn't read about what it was like when civil war gripped the empire, when imperial crowns graced the heads of nobility in Altdorf and Marienburg and Middenheim. In those days it was not the depredation of the orc or the wolf we had to fear, it was the hand of our fellow man that threatened Wormwater. Companies of soldiers would set upon our town, taking what they wanted, killing what they didn't. It mattered little to them whether they were the colors of Reichland or the Emperor in Aldorf. They came with sword and pike to steal food for their bellies, blankets for their steeds, and leather for their feet. Year after year the town was despoiled, forced to toil all year round in the fields only to starve in the winter. Cries for help did nothing. None would raise their hand against the soldiers. The baron who exacted a tithe from this town stayed behind his castle walls, content to ignore the plight as long as there was enough left for him to claim as tribute. The people turned to the gods, praying to them for mercy. Reinheckel spun, stabbing a finger at a fanged idol resting on the altar. One of the gods answered the prayers of my forefathers, witch hunter. 
the horned one sent his children to strike down the pillagers, to deliver our town from its misery and suffering, to free us from the corrupt tyranny of a corrupt land. All that was asked of the town was its devotion and tribute to feed his sacred children. Wormwater had given both before, but never to its own benefit. The Horned One was not the Baron, not your petty Sigmar either. He did not promise things with words, but with deeds. The Horned One would protect us from the Orc and the Wolf, and those men foolish enough to think us easy prey. The Horned One has never strayed from his compact with us. And all it cost you was your souls, Fulman said. Your souls and your humanity. Reinhagel laughed. More wisdom from your weakling god, Templar. Where is Sigmar now? Why does he not brave this temple that was once his to deliver his servants? I shall tell you, because he dares not, because he cowers before the might and the glory of the Horned One. The Horned Rat cares little about its sacred children. How much less must it regard men stupid enough to offer it their prayer? It has promised the Skaven that they will inherit the world, not a deluded madman of some Reichland backwater. Reinheckle snarled in outrage, drawing the knife from his belt. He moved to lunge at Fulman, but was kept from the attack by Andine's restricting hand. It is not for us to destroy these infidels, the fallen curate admonished Reinheckle. Their fate is the prophet's to decide. The curate turned away, retrieving the heavy bell he had brought into the sanctuary. Fulman felt his mind cringe as the curate struck it, sending a noxious brassy note reverberating through the chapel. Andine allowed the last echoes of the note to fade and then struck it again, still harder than before. Twelve times the priest struck the bell, each time the note sounding louder and more strident. Fullman thought his skull would crack by the time the curate finally struck the twelfth note. By then, Lajos was already moaning in agony. One of the flagellants had started to throw at the mouth, and Hausner lost consciousness. Then, as the echoes of the twelfth note began to fade, a thirteenth note sounded. Not from the curate or the bell, but from deep beneath the sanctuary. Fullman saw a section of the floor sink, vanishing into the darkness. The verminous reek flooded into the chapel, threatening to smother him with its overwhelming stench. The people of Wormwater began to hiss and squeal in excitement and adoration, attempting a perverse rendition of the Skaven language. Fulman shook his head at their delusion. The ringing of the bell was not a sacred ritual. It was a warning to their inhuman masters, a sign that all was safe in the sanctuary and that the underfolk could emerge from their burrows. A black furry head poked its way from a hole in the floor, sniffing in the air with its rodent-like snout. The ratman crawled its way into the chapel. Half a dozen of its skin followed, spears and halberds gripped in hand-like paws. They adopted wary, guarded poses, casting nervous glances not only at the congregation and their prisoners, but also at the hole from which they had come. After a moment, something else followed the storm vermin into the chapel something with horns curling from its sides of its rat-like skull. The Gracier's eyes actually glowed with a greenish light, one black paw stroking the hairy collar worn around the thing's neck. Fulman cursed as he recognized the creature and realized what fool he had been. It was the Gracier from Wurtbad, the monster named Skilk. Erasmus Clape had told his nephew where the monster might be found, only too happy to set Fulman on its trail. But the sorcerer had neglected to tell him one very important detail. The Skaven Warren wasn't near Wormwater, it was under it. The Grey Seer hobbled out of the hole, supporting himself on a wooden staff tipped by an iron icon. The cultists began to howl in adoration as their prophet stepped down from the sanctuary. Skilk paid them no notice, eyes fixed in the direction of the prisoners. Even with the energy of the refined warpstone racing through his body, inflaming his mind, Skilk remembered the witch hunter. A Skaven never forgot an enemy, no matter how briefly their paths crossed. The Ratman chittered hungrily, lashing its tail as it drank in Fulman's scent. Hunter man find much much? 
Skilk chittered, hobbling forward. There was spittle dropping from its chisel-like fangs, an air of ravenous menace on its rancid breath. Silja cried out in loathing as the monster came closer. Hunter meat find words. The grey seer chittered again, its inhuman laughter crawling across the prisoners. Fulman felt the full extent of his defeat when the Skaven pulled a skin-bound object from beneath his robe. Das Buch Dune Holden, the tome they had come so far and risked so much to find. Skilk drank in the smell of the witch hunter's defeat, savoring the sensation. Words tell much much, it chittered again. Make Skilk master Skritar. The Gracier stroked the fur collar around his neck again. Soon make Skilk master Seer Lord. Make Skilk master Skaven. Skilk's body trembled as he announced his insane ambition, as the maniacal emotion flooded through him. The Gracier turned, squeaking commands to his storm vermin. The muscular ratkin scurried forward. Feast much when Skilk made Seer Lord. Hunter meat tastes nice nice. Fulman struggled as Skaven paws closed around the ropes binding him, pulling him from the pew. Other Skaven grabbed Krieger and Silja, dragging them towards the dark hole in the chapel floor. Reinhagel sneered as the witch hunters were dragged away. The Burgomeister emerged from the congregation, walking towards Gracier Skilk. The lips of the Skaven curled back as the man's scent filled his senses, displaying sharp fangs. Revered and holy one, your most unworthy servant prays you find this humble offering satisfactory, the Burgomeister said. Reinhackel got no further in the explanation. The Gracier had grown weary of the slave's temerity, of his audacity in daring to speak to his master. Almost quicker than Fullman's eyes could follow, Skilk lunged at Reinhackel, sinking his jaws into the man's throat. Skilk shook his head furiously as he worried the wound, the Burgomeister gagging and choking beneath the Skaven's fangs. The cult howled in horror, but made no move to aid their leader. One moment later, the crazed Gracier released the grip, letting Reinhackel crash to the floor, his body sputtering as life fled from it. Skilk raised his bloodied paws to his muzzle, licking the black fur with his pink tongue. Take hunter meat to larder, the Gracier hissed, savoring the taste of Reinhackel's blood. Soon feast much match. The warpstone laced insanity in Skilk's eyes appeared to intensify. Feast much much after making ritual, after Skilk made Seer Lord.